Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's third telephone town hall hosted by the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. I'm Adam Hardiman, Manager of Public Affairs with the Municipality. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll be your moderator once again this evening. A little bit about how this works before we get started. We will do our absolute best to answer your questions as they come in. We have our staff grouping your questions that come in and then forwarding them on and grouping them by the most asked uh, in the community by you. A reminder as well, if you are on a cell phone and your call gets dropped, you can rejoin us by streaming it at rmwb.ca slash town hall. At this time, I'd like to send things over to Mayor Melissa Blake, who will introduce tonight's participants. Well, thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you joining us for this third telephone town hall, but as you can appreciate, some of the best answers come from the most informed people, and we are lucky again to have some pretty informed people in the room. Tonight, uh, participants include our recovery committee members, Councillor Sheldon Germain, Councillor Keith McGrath, and Councillor Alan Vinnie. From Municipal Administration, we have Dale Benfield, Acting Director of Emergency Management with the Regional Emergency Operations Centre, otherwise known as REOC. We also have Erin O'Neill, who is the Chief of Planning for REOC, Jamie Doyle, Director of Planning and Development, Amanda Hiatus, Manager of Development Integration and Research Economic, Devel Research Economic Development, Heidi Major, who is with the Landlord and Tenant Advisory Community and Family Support Services. Joining us tonight are also some important folks joining us from the Red Cross, Melanie Soler, Insurance Bureau of Canada, Heather Mack and David McGowan. Alberta Environment and Parks, we have Paul McMahon. Alberta Health Services, we have David Mateer, Deborah Samick, Dominic Joseph, Roxanne Drodson, and Shelley Push. And that concludes the folks that we have in the room, and we know there are many questions to be addressed, so I'll let you get right to them, Adam. Oh, thank you so much, Mayor Blake. If you're just joining us out there, thank you for participating. Remember to press star three to ask a question and an operator will take your question. Or you can type your question into the question field online. We will do our best to get you the answers you need. So let's take our first question. We're gonna start online and get a few of those going as the phone calls come in. So this one is from John and his question is, what supports are available currently for small businesses in the community? And we're actually going to go to Amanda Hayes with our Economic Development Department. Hi. Great, great question. Um, all businesses are vital to our community and to our economy here in Wood Buffalo, uh, which is why in, during the evacuation stage, our council had approved a business and economic recovery plan. Uh, there's three phases to that plan, and right now we are in phase one. And phase one is our immediate response. So we do have some um, resources and supports in place, one of them being the business recovery hotline. That phone number can be reached at one eight five five rmwb biz And on that hotline, you can receive um, information about available resources to businesses. We're also conducting a survey to try to get an understanding of uh, what the business needs are within our community so that we're able to respond responsibly. Um, we also have a monetary relief program right now where Red Cross has actually partnered with us and they are transferring $1,000 of immediate relief funding to qualifying businesses. That closes on July 30th, so I would urge anybody who has a, who has a business in Wood Buffalo uh, to call that 1-800 number and uh, get signed up to receive the money. The, another piece, the third piece that we have is our business recovery um, center and that's located in downtown Fort McMurray at 9816 Harden Street, and within that building you can have a one-stop shop for um, business resources and supports. And uh, coming up shortly, we are going to be announcing um, a home building show uh, in August, so stay tuned. All of our updates are on our website at choosewoodbuffalo.ab.ca. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, and we're going to stay online for our next question. This one's from Bill. Bill's asking, returnees to Wood Buffalo received additional Red Cross funding. How can displaced residents currently not in the community access that additional funding? So I'm going to go to Melanie, who's with the Red Cross, to take that for us. Hi, good evening. Thanks for the question, Bill. Um, the returning electronic funds transfer for residents into Fort McMurray is intended to uh, refill fridges and purchase additional cleaning supplies. Residents who remain outside of the uh, RMWB can visit uh, any Red Cross office in Alberta or in any of the other provinces across Canada to receive immediate um, urgent financial assistance. 
Well, thank you so much, Melanie. We're going to stay online as the questions continue to come in from the phone. This one is from Jimmy, and he's asking, uh, can you guys please provide an update on the cleanup and permitting process? For the, so for the first part of that question, I guess it's a two-parter, I'm going to go to uh, David McGowan with uh, IBC, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and then we'll follow it up with Jamie Doyle, our Director of Planning and Development. Adam, thanks very much and good evening all. Uh, the current status of the uh, specs uh, uh, agreement here in uh, RMWB uh, is that uh, I think as many folks know, they've uh, chosen a preferred local contractor and uh, the, uh, they're currently in the final stages of discussion with that preferred local contractor just to finalize the contract. So we expect to have a uh, we expect to have a, uh, a contract uh, signed and announced in the next couple of days. Sorry, Jamie, we'll go to you for the next part of the question. The person was asking about cleanup, but also about uh, permitting. So if we could go on to that portion, please. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thus far, we have 61 uh, demolition permits received. Uh, we received 10 today, and over the weekend, we've issued 14 to date. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Doyle. We know you'll be uh, presenting at our council meeting tomorrow night as well, so we invite our residents to tune in on Shaw TV or to, to visit us uh, in the council chambers tomorrow night. So we're going to take our first question from the phone. Uh, Daryl and Leanne, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good to have you with us. Please go right ahead with your question. My question is about uh, the... Like we lost our home, my husband lost his job up there and everything. We are currently living somewhere else right now. And uh, so our home is gone, but we are wondering, our insurance company is talking about paying us out, but who pays for the land? Is Wood Buffalo paying for the land for the our, like, I guess, where our house st stood? Is that coming from Wood Buffalo? Like, who do we contact for payout, I guess, on that. Well, thank you so much, Leanne. We're going to send that one to Heather Mack, who's joining us from the IBC. Uh, hi. Thanks for the question, Leanne. Sorry to uh, hear that you've lost your home. Um, your insurance policy is just for you, the building on the land. So um, if you are considering doing a cash settlement, and you obviously have to take all of the different factors into account, at the end of it, the land would still belong to you. And it's really important to know that if there is debris and demolition on the land, that's something that you may then be responsible for as well. So you have to consider that in the cash settlement, but ultimately the land is still your responsibility, and then you may choose to sell uh, if that's what you'd like to do. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Leanna. Once again, uh, sorry to hear about your loss. Very difficult for many in the community, and we're with you right now. We're going to go back to the phones. Uh, Kristen, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, go right ahead with your question. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so I haven't been home since the evacuation, and I found out it's recently damaged to smoke, and I got a rare lung disease, and right now I'm currently living in Lloyd, and we're under flood watch um, and on another evacuation alert. Um, sorry. Um, so I'm just wondering, because the insurance company is giving such a hard time, it's not that I don't want anything new, it's, I'm looking for a out for my health, and we're supposed to get a new fridge, and then we did it, and they denied it, and it's documented, and I don't know what to do. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, and uh, sorry to hear about everything that's happened, and uh, we're cutting out a little bit, but that's not your fault. I think that we heard your question asking, I think you were saying that your home was smoke damaged and um, you do have a lung disease. You're looking for, to your insurer for more support. I'm just going to send that over to Heather Mack with IBC to take that for us, please. Thanks, Kristen. And uh, I, I mean, I can hear the stress and frustration in your voice. So um, the first thing I would suggest you do is tomorrow give us a call um, at IBC, at our consumer center in Edmonton, um, because you can talk to somebody there who can also speak to the company on your behalf 
and to help sort things out and maybe get you some clarity and some uh, some control back. Our number is one eight four four two two seven five four two two, and there are lots of um, ways to go about dispute resolution with the insurance companies. There's internal processes to each company, but the province also has a dispute resolution um, system in place, uh, so the government's overseeing that. But probably best if you give us a call and we can walk you through what all your options are, and if you're comfortable, we're happy to speak with the company on your behalf as well uh, to maybe we can shoulder some of the load for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heather. We're actually going to go back online for our next question. This question is from Susan, and she's asking us, what was found in the test results, the environmental test results, released by the province today? So I'm going to send this over to the government of Alberta, and we're here with uh, Paul. Paul, if you could get the first part of that question for us. Uh, sure. Thanks, Susan, for the, uh, the question. Uh, so for environment, uh, the regional municipality and uh, the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association have collected a lot of different environmental information. So uh, information on air quality, uh, ash, soil, water, both in the drinking water system as well as uh, water in uh, the receiving waters like the Athabasca River. Um, so with the results of some of that, I can run through it uh, quickly. As far as uh, air quality goes, uh, shortly after the fire, of course, air quality was poor, but has returned to uh, fairly normal um, now. Uh, and you know, shortly after the uh, the fire was, uh, you know, largely uh, passed through the uh, the city or around the city and through the city, uh, the some in-neighborhood sampling is uh, ongoing and to monitor for potential uh, movement of ash that might have some contaminants in it. And uh, right to date, uh, there hasn't been any indication that uh, that ash has been uh, mobilized and moving from neighborhood to neighborhood. The TAC fire is doing a good job of uh, keeping those uh, that ash in place as to where it fell, uh, you know, during the fire. Um, some of the ash results, um, not unexpectedly, uh, there were some fairly high contaminants in certain uh, types of contaminants that uh, we would expect uh, when uh, homes and uh, and other, uh, you know, man-made uh, materials are burned. Uh, but for the most part, uh, they have not exceeded uh, human health guidelines. Uh, there are some in some areas, but it's uh, very localized. A lot of the soil testing that was occurred. Um, Post-fire, I mean, within the last uh, few weeks, they've indicated that uh, well, there are some uh, environmental guidelines that have exceeded in some places. Uh, for the most part, uh, they haven't, and there are no exceedance of, of human health guidelines so far in the soil samples that we've tested in the burned and unburned areas. As far as the water uh, goes, uh, for drinking water facilities, and uh, the we tested the water. Uh, coming out of the facility, the treatment facility immediately post-fire, it was creating good water. We tested water in the distribution system, so the reservoirs and the pipes that moved the water from the reservoirs to uh, two homes, and uh, we uh, they came out clean. Uh, but as a precaution, we uh, uh, the uh, boil water advisory is in place until the cleaning is completed and testing post-cleaning can be done just to make sure that no contaminants were introduced into the drinking water system during the cleaning process. So we're waiting for some of those results still to come back. Um, and uh, the waters, uh, the receiving waters in the uh, Athabasca River, uh, nothing unusual. Uh, I mean, as have we detected, I mean, certainly, you know, there's higher concentrations of turbidity and, and ash and that kind of thing, but uh, at this point, uh, nothing uh, unusual, and that uh, monitoring will be ongoing for uh, months and years to come. Well, thank you so much, Paul, and we invite our listeners out there to go to the Government Alberta website where they can read all about the latest environmental testing results that were released earlier today. So please visit that website to get more information and to get all the details on this new information that's come out. We're going to move right along here, and we're going to go back to the phones. Don, are you with us? Hi, Don, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Good to have you with us. Uh, go right ahead with your question. Yeah, so I uh, live in Abyssin. My house is on the south side. It's still standing, but obviously, 80% of the homes around it are gone. I'm just curious. I know that they've set a guy, or they said they want all cleanup done by the 
30th. That's the deadline, 30th of September. And I'm just curious, what's going to be any put in place for people who don't comply? I know some people are not wanting to use um, the company that's being provided to the city or they don't want to do it, have the company con- the insurance contracted out. They want to do it on their own. So if people are taking a long time and going beyond the deadline, I'm just wondering if there's going to be fines in place uh, just because we're not able to move back until this cleanup of the debris is uh, obviously in care of. That's my question. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to send that to Jamie Doyle, our Director of Planning and Development. Thanks. Uh, great question, Don. Um, there is a process in place, and what happens is the municipality has the option or the ability to uh, issue what's called a demolition order, which outlines timelines that a homeowner or a property owner has to have um, that property cleaned up by. If they don't, the municipality can enter onto the property, clean it up for them, and charge it back to their tax roll. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie, for outlining that option that the municipality could take. I'm going to keep going and remind everybody, if you're just joining us, if you want to ask a question, press star 3 on your phone's keypad and give your question to one of our great operators. If you are joining us online, please type your question into the question field at rmwb.ca slash townhall. We're going to go back to the phones. Andy, are you there? Yep. Andy, are yes, you Yes, I was wondering, I... We registered for re-entry on June 3rd, and I still haven't received my re-entry payment yet. I was from the Red Cross. I was just wondering what was going on. Well, thank you so much for the question, and we're going to send that to Melanie with the Red Cross, please. Hi. Thanks for your question. Um, I apologize for any frustrations and the delay in getting that money. We understand that that money um, is urgent for people. Uh, wanting to uh, get their households back in order. Uh, If we can have your uh, name and contact information after the call, certainly follow up with my team to see um, what's happened with your electronic funds transfer. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that. And we're going to go back online. I'm going to read a question here from Samantha. question is, my AMA insurance has a home replacement cost guarantee, but my adjuster says this is under review. What should I do? I'm going to send that one over to Dave McGowan with IBC, please. Or sorry, we're going to go to Heather Mack, actually, at IBC. My mistake. Hi. Um, That's interesting because, well, ultimately your insurance policy is a contract. So if the insurer guaranteed something, uh, they have to abide by that. So I'm not really sure what the adjuster is communicating to you about it. Um, but you could give us a call at IBC and uh, we could do a little more investigating because if you do have guaranteed replacement costs, that really is the end of it. That's that's what you will get. So give us a call tomorrow, uh, 1-844-227-5422, and hopefully we can help sort this out for you. Well, thank you so much, Heather. We're going to go back to the phones. Uh, Manish, are you with us? Manish, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Good to have you with us. Go right ahead with your question. Uh, my question is, when will be uh, Fort McMurray transportation will be resumed? People are facing lots of difficulty to catch the city bus. They have to walk uh, like a kilometer, half kilometer. Well, thank so you when so will much, be sir, the for... city bus service will be back to normal? Sorry for cutting you off there. Thank you so much for your question. I'm going to send that to our Chief of Planning, Erin O'Neill, please. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Manish, for your question. Transit services was restored on July the 4th. It might be different than the transit that you were used to pre-fire, as transit is basing the plans based on the individuals that have re-entered at the time in our current population. Um, So they will be monitoring this and will update those transit services as required. Well, thank you so much, Erin. We're going to go back to the phones. Sheila, are you there? I am. Well, it's great to have you. Go right ahead with your question, please. Um, a couple of weeks ago at the town council meeting, a gentleman stood up and wondered if they were going to be making contact, if the task force or the committee was going to be making contact with the Bank of Canada to help people 
maybe put their mortgages on pause, like to, to kind of help through the rebuild, because not a lot of people have insurance or, you know, adequate insurance to, to, for ALE. And I'm just wondering if there's been any feedback on that so we don't go bankrupt, maybe? <laughs> Thank you so much for the question, Sheila. I guess a bit of a two-part answer. So we'll go to IBC. We'll go to David McGowan. Thank you so much. Sure, Adam. Uh, happy, to, happy to start the answer in, in part because before I joined the insurance industry, uh, I spent 25 years in the, bank, in the world of banking. Uh, so let me put that hat on, if you will. Um, and thank you for your question. The Bank of Canada actually would have no role at all uh, in, in talking to folks about uh, mortgages or postponing mortgages or taking any kind of, uh, of broad response. Uh, that's actually a question that you could and should have with your uh, individual bank manager, uh, a little bit like the insurance business when you're talking to your, your adjuster. So that's where uh, a conversation should start uh, on a case-by-case -case basis if there are particular circumstances that, uh, that the bank can take into consideration when uh, when thinking about uh, how to deal with uh, with your financial situation moving forward. Well, thank you so much. And we'll also go to the Recovery Committee to, uh, to take the second part of this question. We'll go to Councillor Alvini, please. Yeah. Hey, Sheila, thanks for the question. Um, just to follow up, um, yes, it, it is true it's not the Bank of Canada's uh, Role, but we have made contact with the Canadian Bankers Association and Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and we're uh, going to be meeting with those parties as well as meeting with some of the uh, major banks, um, with uh, you know at, at a vice president level or above. So, um, well, it's. True that you want to initiate the conversation with your with your local branch. Um, we are working on having these meetings with uh, with the major players uh, behind the scenes, uh, the Canadian Bankers Association, which is similar to the Insurance Bureau of Canada in that the CBA represents uh, um, the Canadian banks and uh, will uh, listen to to us speak to things that uh, people would be needing, like you say, uh, some sort of break on the insurance, or sorry, on the interest and, and or payments for some period of time. And, and we'll also uh, see what can mortgage and housing corporation uh, might have uh, in mind that they could do. So thanks very much for that question. Well, thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, Councillor Vinny. We're gonna go back to the phones. Uh, Jared, are you there? Jared, are you with us? Yes. Go right ahead with your question, I'm, sir. My question uh, is uh, about environmental testing. I, I uh, was pleased to see the results of the phase two testing today and certainly a sigh of relief. Um, over the last couple of weeks, people have uh, indicated on social media that they've had some private testing done that, that wasn't quite as positive. Um, I'm wondering if there's any ideas as to why there's a discrepancy between, uh, you know, the um, quality of the soil in particular. Um, another bit of uh, concern I have is, is whether um, we should be, people are encouraged to have testing done in their house and under what circumstances should they, how do we know our houses are, uh, you know, the air quality is, is good in there. Any recommendations? Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for your question. I think about a two-parter. Go to Paul McMahon with Alberta Environment and Parks, and then I'm going to go to Dave McGowan with IBC. Uh, hi, Jared. Thanks for your uh, question. So, um, you know, the results or the sampling we conducted, uh, well, we actually the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo for the most part, uh, and they burned in unburned areas. Um, they uh, sampled most if not all of the neighborhoods that were, well, all the neighborhoods that were affected, as well as some that weren't very affected at all. Um, why are, so I guess your question was, why are some of the results that we posted, uh, which are fairly encouraging, 
uh, are different than some of the results that maybe individual homeowners have uh, obtained from their properties. So uh, contaminants can be very localized. Uh, you know, on properties, it might be that the contaminants were there already due to, uh, you know, uh, the source of the soil or due to, uh, you know, somebody storing a lead battery or building a, uh, a deck and, uh, you know, and, and, and sawing, uh, you know, preserved you know, or, uh, or treated wood uh, preservative. And so you can get some local, very local hot spots in that. So I would expect that there would be differences if uh, folks are uh, sampling in different areas than, than our samples, but uh, they should be very localized. Uh, so we were looking at really the components of the uh, fire and uh, what fell out in the ash. And uh, so that's, that's why there could be differences between uh, what other folks have uh, have found on their personal properties, as well as the methodology that was used. There's different methodologies for different purposes. So, without seeing the results and how the you know how the sampling was conducted and uh, what kind of uh, uh, analysis was done, uh, you know, in the labs, uh, differences can occur. And Adam, it's David McGowan, and thank you for the question, sir. The uh, certainly uh, environmental testing. Uh, on your home, whether it's before debris removal uh, in your neighborhood occurs or after, uh, would be would be a uh, a cost that uh, you could uh, you could discuss with your adjuster, uh, and would be part of uh, the normal course uh, costs that uh, an, your insurance policy should cover. So if you sit down and have that conversation with your adjuster, uh, identify uh, the, a preferred uh, environmental testing uh, company. Uh, that should be part of uh, of your uh, your insurance package. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jared, for the question. Thank you, Paul, for the initial part of that response. Remember to ask a question if you're just joining us. Press star three on your phone's keypad and give your question to one of our wonderful operators. If you are joining us online, please type your question into the question field rmwb.ca slash townhall. We're going to go to an online question now. We're going to take this one from Tim. I'll read it out here. The question is, can we start rebuilding as soon as our property is cleaned up? And I think, obviously, in the question, we're not sure what neighborhood uh, Tim is with. So I think we'll do a two-part answer. We'll go to Jamie Doyle, our Director of Planning and Development. Then we'll also go to uh, Paul McMahon with Alberta Environment for a second portion. Jamie, go right ahead. Thanks, Adam, and great question. Once the cleanup process has or once you have your demolition permit approved and you finish your cleanup, you can certainly make an application to begin your rebuild process. Uh, that require another application process that we review on a case-by-case -case basis and, and approve there and after. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. I'll go to Paul for the environmental aspect of that question. Yeah, can you please repeat that? Paul here. Yeah, so Paul, the question from Tim was, uh, can we start rebuilding as soon as our property is cleaned up? Uh, I think really that's a question for the regional municipality. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I guess Jamie answered the first portion of that. We'll also send it to Dale Benfeld, our actor directing of, director of emergency management, please. Thank you, uh, Tim. What occurs is after you've done your demolition, there's going to be a phase three uh, testing done of your soil, and from that we will start the process to establish what we need to ensure that the demolition is going safely. And then you go through the application process and we move forward. Uh, our intent is not to slow you down, but to ensure everything is done safely. Thank you very much, Dale, for that great response. You would have have. Okay, sorry about that, guys. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty there on the phone. We're going to go back to the phones. Uh, Kara, are you there? Kara, are you with us? Is it Cara? Mm -hmm. I might be getting it wrong. I'm sorry about that. Yes, it's it's Cara. Great. Go right ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the ban on children under seven was ever lifted. I know that once the hospital was up and running, it was said that you could kind of decide on your own if it was safe for you and your family to re return. But I never really heard anything official saying it was safe for kids to return, especially with this new testing and some of the contaminants coming out high. Just wanted to make sure it's safe for kids to be around. 
Uh, thank you so much for the question. We're going to go over to our Senior Director with AHS, David Matier, please. Hi, Cara. Thanks very much for that question. Absolutely understandable. You want to know if the environment is safe for children. And I can tell you that the, um, the messaging that, that came out today um, from Alberta Health Services does confirm that we now have access to all the health care services that were available uh, before the wildfire. And uh, there are no longer any advisories or concerns for residents looking to return to the city, and that would include children under seven. Thank you so much, David. We're going to continue uh, on the phones. Is Barbara there, please? Yeah, go ahead. Thank yes, you so much hello? for joining us. You go right ahead with your question, Barbara. I'd like to know what um, the city or the government is going to do to help the people in the disaster zones that do not have house insurance and their homes are still standing, but yet they are damaged inside and no house insurance. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, and uh, sorry about any misfortune that you've, that's happened over the last little bit. We're gonna send that to the Red Cross, actually, Melanie Solar, who's with us, please. Hi, thanks for the question. Uh, the Canadian Red Cross uh, will be present in Fort McMurray to um, do one-on-one -on -one uh, needs case assessments uh, with all um, residents who are impacted the fire, by the fire who are uninsured or underinsured. Uh, so my recommendation would be that uh, if you could um, if you could go to our uh, Red Cross office if you're in Fort McMurray or find a Red Cross office uh, in other parts of Canada and Calgary or Edmonton. Uh, that will do a one on one case assessment to identify what your gaps are because you don't have insurance. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, that answer. And we'll move on here to the online portion. Uh, this question is from Polari. Um, my insurance will not cover lawn damage caused by bulldozers. What should I do? So we're going to send that one over to David with the IBC, please. Oh, sorry, we're going to go to Heather with IBC. Thank you. Hi, that's a great question. Um, uh, as I said earlier, your insurance policy only deals with the buildings on your land. Some policies will have a little bit of wording and maybe a limit, maybe of $500 or something for replacing trees or shrubs. Uh, but if, if you're talking about bulldozer damage, um, soil that's ripped up, things like that, that's not something that's typically covered by uh, most home insurance policies in Canada. Uh, if your insurer says no, that I'm, unfortunately um, there isn't much else uh, as far as coverage there. Uh, sorry to pass on the bad news. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I'm going to go back to the phones. I, I, sorry if I mispronounced this. Is it Jigar? Are you there? Hello. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing good, sir. Thank you very much. Good to have so, you. Go, right ahead with, go ahead with your question. Yeah, my question is that I'm the small uh, home builder in the town. So how I be a part of the rebuild uh, Fort McMurray? Do I need to register myself to in the city or how I can work? Hello? Yeah, be right there. Just, I think we lost you there for a second, so I'm going to repeat the question. So it's... You're saying you're a contractor. Uh, how can I take part in the rebuild process as a contractor? Yeah, I'm basically I'm the uh, small builder uh, building the houses in town. Thank you so much. So we're going to send this to our chief of planning in the REAC, Aaron O'Neill, please. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for the question. Um, on the um, municipal website, there is an, an option of where you can provide offer for resources, um, so where you can um, be available for contracting that will come out through the city. Um, we, the Insurance Bureau of Canada will also be announcing um, the successful proponents for the um, specs contract for that demolition process, um, so you will know that information coming out shortly and be able to participate that way, and you may also want to look at contacting um, construct, the Fort McMurray Construction Association and Urban Development Institute or UDI Wood Buffalo and get involved in those groups as well um, so that you're aware of um, all the opportunities that are available in Fort McMurray. 
Thank you so much, Aaron. We're going to go back to our online questions, which are coming in. This one's from Romana. Uh, her question is, after debris cleanup, how long can a lot stay unbuilt? I'm going to send this to our Director of Planning and Development, Jamie Doyle, please. Thank you, Adam. Um, all the, 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 I guess, damaged properties will need to be uh, cleaned up by September 30th. Um, and then once that process is finished, a rebuild uh, portion will take, will begin. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. We're going to go on back to the phones. Lori, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Please go right ahead with your question. Uh, I live on the south side of Abisam. My house is still standing. And last week in the town hall, you guys had said that contractors were allowed in between 8 and 8 now. But I'm wondering for things like insulation replacement and stuff like that in an attic, would it be feasible to do something like that right now? Or will it get contaminated again once debris removal happens? Uh, thank you so much, Larry. I'm going to go to our Acting Director of Emergency Management, Mr. Dale Benfeld, please. Thank you, Larry. Uh, a couple of points that you made, I think you've answered some of the question yourself. The, the issue is when we do demolition, there's going to be dust. So if we go and clean something up before we have demolition done, we're going to have to do it all over again. And of course, that's an issue between you and the insurance, and they'll only want to do it once, and you'll only want to do it once. So the best bet, a course of action, is let the demolition complete. And then once we got the demolition out, then we can start doing all those repairs that we need to get done so it's done once. Well, thank you so much, Dale. We're going to go back to the phones. Selena, are you with us out there? Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good to have you with us. I'm go great to be here, out. actually. Um, I was raised and born in McMurray, and I left there in 94. But I chose to take a trade that took me up into the northern and I was evacuated uh, the days that, that your city was going up for refugee. You know, like, look, look. <laughs> anyway, I, I have a question on Red Cross. Um, I would like to know how Red Cross is being dispersed because I'm eligible myself for up to $2,000 worth of uh, money. And I don't even live there. Yes, I was out of work for four weeks, but I got back to work and life is good. But I also know a lot of McMurrians that are still waiting to go back to work. I'm just curious on Red Cross, like how they can um, disperse their money, how they're dispersing their money. Well, thank you so much, Selena. And we're going to go to Melanie Solar with the Red Cross, please. Hi, thanks for your question. Um, in the initial evacuation phase, uh, we launched a program um, for emergency evacuation assistance uh, while uh, people were displaced. And so anyone who was registered and uh, then after a certain date could validate their uh, residency that they were from the impacted area received um, a sum of money um, based on adults and children during the evacuation period. We also provided additional financial assistance to people who had unmet urgent needs uh, for emergency food, clothing, uh, lodging, other personal services during that evacuation period. Upon re-entry, uh, we provided additional financial assistance for um, folks going back home. Uh, as mentioned earlier, that was intended to uh, refill fridges and purchase additional cleaning supplies. After that, we have a process whereby uh, we will do confidential one-on-one -on -one case assessments uh, to determine uh, unmet needs uh, for things like clothing, um, uninsured uh, furniture, uh, personal services, occupational supports, transportation. Uh, all of those assessments are done by qualified caseworkers one-on-one on-site at a Red Cross office. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie. We'll go uh, back to the phones. Uh, Dennis, are you there? 
Yes, I yes I am. I just want to say hello to everybody. Okay, I'm a resident of Abbasin. My home was torched by the fire, lost the house, two cars, and the impact of, that hurt me the most was my parrot. But here's my question. It's a two-parter. First off, it was row housing, meaning the patio homes. And I want to know if that's the plan is to put patio homes back in the same place. Or are you guys going to rebuild their period? Because I've been trying to find out that answer basically since the fire, and I cannot get a straight answer on whether Abbasan will be rebuilt or not. Well, thank you so much, Dennis, and uh, sorry to hear about your loss, especially uh, about your pet. Uh, I'm going to send this over to uh, Jamie Doyle, the Director of Planning and Development, for the first part. Thank you. Thanks, Adam, and great question, Dennis. As the rebuild process begins, any rebuild will need to meet the requirements of the land use bylaw as it sits today, as well as the Alberta, Alberta Building Code as it sits today, or the day that you actually apply. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie. I know you had a second part to your question there, Dennis, so I'm going to send that to Dale Benfeld, our Director of Emergency Management, please. Hey, thanks, Dennis. Um, what we have to look at here is in Abbasan, there's individual, sorry, you want that? Oh, uh, there are individual homeowners. How you rebuild and when they rebuild, all right, is a factor that comes to each homeowner. Now, when it comes to what type and style it is, is based on what your insurance allows you to have and what your permit and your land use allows you to have. So that's what we have to look at in that context. So this is Mayor Melissa, and I'm going to be a bit more blunt than that. The concern that I see, frankly, for somebody like yourself in row housing is that if you've got a multifamily unit, it's going to be more complicated trying to get everybody in the unit to agree to the rebuild. And again, your walls are, contingent, are, are tied to each other, making it so difficult for me to imagine every single person in the unit saying, yeah, we're all good to go at the same time. Um, my apologies as well on the loss of your, your beloved pet, but the complications that you face are greater than single family homes in any area. Even duplexes are a little better off because there's only one neighbor that they have to clear it with. Otherwise, what we're looking at is a zoning change application into the future um, for something different on that site. But right now, the, the way it looks is that if you've got zoning for a particular rebuild type, that's what's expected to be returned. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We're going to go back online here. This question is from Iris. Will the fire break behind Shale Stone Way be cleaned up? I'll send that over to Aaron O'Neill, our Chief of Planning, please. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Iris, for your question. Um, the fire break behind Shale Stone Way, um, so there was there was the fire break that was done of the houses. Those will be cleaned up as part of the demolition. Um, there was also fire breaks done um, of the houses around Eagle Ridge and in the Stone Creek area. Um, those will be cleaned up and restored. Um, there was a presentation made at the council meeting last week which shows you some of the um, before and after pictures of what that will look like. So if you want to check out um, last week's council agenda, which is still posted on rmwb.ca, you can see some pictures of what that fire break will look like when it's cleaned up. Well, thank you so much, Erin. As we near 15 minutes remaining in our call tonight, now remember if you're just joining us, if you'd like to ask a question, press star three on your phone's keypad and give your question to one of our superb operators. If you're joining us online, please type your question in the question field, rmwb.ca slash town hall. We're going to go back to the phones. Anuj, are you there? Yes, sir. Great, great to have you with us. Go right ahead with your question. Yes, sir. My, I, sir uh, I was living at the 235 Prospect Drive, and my house and car was fully burnt out. And I was just wondering, is that the, the insurance will go ahead and uh, get a, get the demolition and cleanup permit for us, or as an individual, we uh, resident of that area, would go ahead and get the permit from the city? Well, thank you so much, sir. And I'm going to go to David McGowan with IBC, please. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Anuj. Um, 
with respect to uh, who, let's, let's start with a part of the question around who, who will clean up your, uh, the home. And again, uh, in discussions with your adjuster, uh, you absolutely have choice as to whether or not it's, uh, if you will, a preferred supplier uh, or another local contractor. In either case, there's a, a process to apply for a demolition permit uh, that uh, I believe uh, would be the responsibility of your contractor, who's the capable uh, 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 entity uh, who knows how to clean up uh, property in this kind of environment. Thank you so oh. much, David. We're going to go back to our online questions. This one's from Carrie. If provincial test results have been positive, and Carrie, I think what you mean by positive based on your question is that they're a good thing, does this mean that is it, it is likely that we can return to restricted areas soon? So I'm going to send that to uh, Paul McMahon with Alberta Environment and Parks, please. So it's, thanks for your, uh, for your question. So we've... Uh, you know, we've completed the testing, and I think uh, to return to the, uh, you know, Abbasands and, and Beacon Hill and Waterways, the most impacted, uh, the most impacted neighborhoods, that's really uh, probably something that is Alberta Health and, uh, and Environment and Region Municipal will have to have that discussion. But my, I suspect that uh, probably be uh, wise to wait until the, uh, the demolition and the cleanup is completed uh, to uh, avoid uh, potential you know, ash, uh, contaminated ash, uh, moving during that process. But uh, that's, uh, that's something that uh, will have to be determined by those three parties. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And I think we're going to have Aaron O'Neill, our Chief of Planning, follow up on that. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Adam. Um, the, the, the main reason why the residents in the restricted areas of Abbasan, Beacon Hill, and Waterways are not back into their homes yet are the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, we are working closely with Alberta Health Services um, to remedy some of those situations um, as we would like to see um, residents back into those homes as soon as possible as well. So we are working closely with Alberta Health um, on the risks in those areas to mitigate those um, so we, we can see those residents back into that area. Um, currently, the um, requirements are that debris is cleaned up, and we are working through um, any mitigation that we can have in place so that we can see you move back home. Thank you so much, Aaron, and for that response. We're going to move on uh, back to the phones. Heather, are you there? I am. Go right ahead with your question, please. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a complicated uh, question, my apologies, but I'm curious, I'm the president of a condominium unit up in Abbasand, 48 homes, and I'm wondering if there's a firm date as to when people can start moving back into Abbasand, um, and if they're, going, if they're going to be able to move back into Abbasand, is it going to be prior to the, de the debris being removed, or is it going to be after the debris is removed? because people's personal claims cannot be related with a condo claim until the condo does the uh, testing within the units, and we're, we can't do the testing within the units until the civics has been removed. So it's, it's very difficult for me to make decisions for 48 homeowners without some sort of firmity from the, the region municipality or the province. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm going to go back to Aaron O'Neill, our Chief of Planning in the REOC, please. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Heather, for your question. Um, we are working closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health and Alberta Health Services um, on her recommendations for those restricted areas um, so that we can get people back into their homes as soon as possible. We are working on mitigation strategies and are in close contact um, so that we can um, hopefully get you home as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Aaron, and we're going to go back to the phones. Joseph, are you there with us? Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> uh, kind of uh, my question is a follow-up on, the, I guess, the last meeting we had, the uh, town hall meeting we had, uh, it was mentioned that there might be some contractors, that uh, general contractors, that uh, will do the cleaning. Of course, people have the choice to do them do it themselves or use their own contract or the general one. So it was agreed that the <clears throat> information will be posted 
regarding how much will be the cost for the general contractor so people can choose if they want to go with the general contractor. So has that been uh, done and where if it's been posted and where is that that we can look up those info? Thank you so much for the question, Joseph. We're going to go to IBC. David McGowan, please take that one for us. Adam, thank you. And Joseph, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the call, but we'll, we'll happily uh, mention it again. Uh, the specs and its preferred contractor uh, are in the final stages of discussions around the, you know, just the, the nature of their contract. Uh, the, their full expectation is that contract will be signed within the next day or two. Uh, and once it's signed, the costs associated with uh, demolition and debris removal for single-family homes, townhomes, uh, you know, whether uh, whether or not there's uh, uh, any kind of uh, special material there uh, will all be public. Uh, th that information will be available from your insurance adjuster. Well, thank you so much, David. We're going to go back online. Uh, this question is from Tom. He asks, where can I find information about the disposal, disposal sorry, of demolition debris? I'm going to go to uh, Jamie Doyle for that one, please. Thank you, Adam, uh, for that question. Anybody can go to our website and look under the landfill uh, tab, and there's all kinds of great information there for you to look into and uh, provide, uh, or there, is a, there should be a number there for you to call and get some further information on details. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And I can also tell you from the communication side, Jamie's absolutely correct. You can also go to rmwb.ca slash demolition. You can also call the Pulse Line anytime, 780-743-7000. Visit us on Twitter or Facebook for more information. Thank you so much for your question. We're going to go back to the phones. Karen, are you there? Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, not too bad. Thanks for taking my call. No problem. So, Go right ahead with your question, please. Well, uh, so my husband and I had our RV parked at the backside of Centennial RV Park. Um, so we were first to be evacuated on the Sunday. But we've since, on the 29th of June, gotten a pretty nasty letter from the owner uh, being a numbered company. So we can't even say who it is. It came through care of Larry Miller. Um, but it's telling us that we're required to have all of the debris on our lot cleaned up, removed by July 15th, or this numbered company is um, going to assign a designated company to clean it up on my behalf and send me a bill. Um, they also threaten failure to respond by this DocuSign by July 7th to the above notice. Here guys, hereby gives formal notice to this numbered company to act on my behalf. Now, I had fire insurance on our RV, and our claim has not been finalized yet. Um, and so the frame to the RV is there. Uh, and I don't know, am I supposed to take notice of this? Uh, the residents have gotten together and tried to work on this, but we've been treated sort of differently than Beacon Hill, Abbasan, and Waterway, but sort of in the same boat. You know, we were... Uh, where it's got all that white stuff on it and, and that sort of stuff. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this kind of, uh, to me, believes to be threatening. Thank you so much, Karen, and we're sorry to hear about everything you've been through. We're certainly well aware of the situation. I'm going to send this over to Dale Benfeld, Acting Director of Emergency Management, please. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I, I, first, uh, we have to look at is the fact that Centennial Park is privately owned. And yeah. these are mobile trailers that we're talking about that are on pads as opposed to individual homes that are owned as property. Um, I think we, we need to delve a little bit deeper in this one. Um, what I'll ask you to do is um, if we'll get some information from you, and we will contact you, and we'll talk about this further uh, tomorrow, okay? Thank you so much, uh, Dale, and thank you so much, Karen, for the question. We're going to go back uh, to the online portion of the questions coming in. Are there plans to condemn the standing homes in Beacon Hill? We're going to send that back to our Director of Emergency Management, Dale Benfeld, please. Uh, thank you for the question. Our intent, we have no intent um, to condemn homes. That is a, an issue that comes between health, construction, there's a lot of factors in Paul. Well, you have to talk to your insurance adjuster on that one. Thank you so much.
so much, uh, Dale. We're going to go have just a few more questions. That's correct here from our operating team, just because we're getting close to the 8 o'clock time mark. So we're going to do one more, and uh, we're going to go to the phones for our final question here tonight. Uh, Tim, are you there? Yes, I am. Go right ahead with your question, sir. Uh, Tim Lewick from the Lewick Park Campground. Uh, just wondering if there's going to be a need for uh, stalls for the people that are in their uh, RVs in Abram Landing or uh, wherever else they are in town. Uh, we have approximately 100 stalls available and just want to know if there's going to be a need when the uh, school season comes back in or when the weather starts to change, if uh, Abram Landing is going to be able to provide the services, the water, power, sewer, uh, that is going to be uh, year-round, or should we be expecting a, a large influx at some point? And if so, who would I contact uh, just so that we're prepared? Thank you so much for the question, Tim. We're going to go back to Aaron O'Neill, our director, sorry, our chief of planning in the REAC. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Tim, for your question. Um, Abrams Landing is only open until September 30th, 2016, um, so that those services will no longer be offered as of September 30th. So if you are going to see an influx of people, I would plan for the September 30th date. Um, we will take down your information, though, and we will give you a call tomorrow um, about that information so that you can um, plan for any surge that may be happening. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. And like I said, that concludes uh, the calls for tonight as well as the online questions. Before we close things out, I'd like to send things over to Mayor Blake to make some closing remarks. Well, thank you very much. And that is, in fact, all I want to say is thank you to each of our callers who made it through on the line tonight and those who had their online questions answered. And my regrets to those of you who submitted but were unable to get yours answered. Adam will tell you what you can do uh, coming up next with that. But for the people in the room, you have my appreciation for being here tonight to be able to provide the responses that we were able to. To my Recovery Committee uh, Council colleagues, thank you. You always have a, a big load on your plate, but having you participate here is very helpful in hearing the concerns of our residents. And now you, the residents, we thank you as well for joining us for this session. I'll turn it back to Adam so he can help out those folks who have some unanswered questions. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mayor Blake, members of the Wood Buffalo Recovery Committee, and everyone here that's joined us here tonight, and especially, of course, our residents, the thousands of you that joined us once again this evening. Thank you so much for your questions. A full audio replay will be available soon at rmwb.ca slash townhall. We do recognize that not everyone's question was answered tonight. We thank you for your understanding as we do our best to answer similar questions that have been submitted the most throughout our call tonight. We invite you to visit rmwb.ca, call the Pulse Line at 780-743-7000, or to interact with us on Facebook or Twitter to connect with the municipality. The next telephone town hall is next Monday, July 18th, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Have a good evening as we stay safe, resilient, and together as a community. Thank you.